So in the spring of 2010, I drove to a suburb of Manchester, New Hampshire uh, for an interview with JT, a practitioner of EVP. Uh, EVP stands for, as I'm guessing lots of people in the room already are well aware, uh, electronic voice phenomenon, a term that designates both the practice of recording the voices of ghosts with tape and digital recorders, as well as those voices themselves. So it gets used to say, I'm doing EVP or that is an EVP, uh, are both acceptable statements. Uh, it was a nice day, so we sat on her back porch, and as our small talk transitioned into a more formal series of questions and answers, I took out my Edderall R09 digital recorder, put it on the table, and hit the record button. A little while later, JT took out her Panasonic DR60 voice-activated recorder and put it on the table as well. Whereas my recorder was documenting our conversation for the purpose of ethnography, uh, her recorder would be collecting an entirely different set of sounds and for different reasons. JT announced that the recorder was running and any ghosts in the vicinity should feel welcome to speak. We then waited a couple minutes in silence, or rather, near silence. A breeze whispered through the trees in the backyard, cars and trucks passed uh, down the highway at the end of her street, and JT's aging dog trotted stiffly back and forth on the wooden planks of the porch. As usual, the world around us was filled with those sounds that rise to the surface of consciousness when we quiet ourselves. In this paper, I want to try to hear EVP anew, specifically as a practice, a practice that hundreds, more likely thousands, and according to one source, even tens of thousands, uh, which seems unlikely to me, but, uh, of Americans perform on a regular or semi-regular basis. In this sort of hearing, I will refrain from slamming the gavel so to speak, in the manner of some critics who level accusations of mishearing, delusion, obsession, and wishful thinking at practitioners of EVP. These criticisms render EVP static in both senses of the word. First, as mere interference on a communication channel, and second, as something of, uh, stuck or in stasis uh, in an obsessive or unhealthy longing. Instead, I want to suggest that EVP is better understood as an ongoing experimental practice of assembling sound technology in the service of exploring affective, experiential, and narrative terrain that is declined or forbidden by mainstream science and, perhaps less obviously, mainstream mourning practices. I think it is no coincidence that EVP has its origin uh, at the moment when consumer-grade audio recording equipment becomes available to the American and European publics in the form of reel-to-reel -reel magnetic tape recorders. Uh, there are, of course, Several examples of otherworldly recordings made prior to this with different audio technology. Um, and famously, Thomas Edison conceived of an amplifier that would make audible the still sentient uh, life units of a recently deceased person. One could arguably go all the way back to the book of Daniel in the Hebrew Bible for instances of the real ceasing not to write itself, as Kittler would say. But I prefer to stick with the historical range given by my uh, informants. Uh, as well as the contemporary literature on EVP that I've been able to find. According to these sources, EVP had its official discovery between 1957 and 1959 with a series of recordings made by Friedrich Jurgensen, a Swede who had trained as an opera singer before switching uh, to a career as a painter, ultimately painting portraits and making documentary films for the Vatican. The story of Jurgensen's uh, discovery is mundane on its surface. He was recording the singing uh, of a finch near his house. Uh, but it can also be read, I think, with a little panache, uh, as a modern renegade science founding myth as well. In the midst of conducting some standard ornithological documentation, a new species of vocalization suddenly intrudes into the auditory scene. The experience was powerful for Jurgensen, and he ultimately documented his subsequent recordings of these voices uh, in books that drew the attention of Latvian psychologist uh, Konstantin Rodeve, uh, who had trained under Carl Gustav Jung. In good Jungian form, Raudiva was receptive to a rather broad range of human experiences, and after visiting Jurgensen, he began making his own recordings, eventually publishing his uh, book, What is Inaudible Becomes Audible, in 1968, later translated into English under the title Breakthrough. Raudiva is probably uh, the best known figure in EVP history and the one who did the most to popularize and standardize the practice. Uh, he also serves as a role model for contemporary EVP practitioners a hybrid of scientist and tinkerer, skeptic and believer, formally trained but methodologically iconoclastic. Rodiva regarded his experiments as scientific and developed a variety of new techniques for improving communication with the dead. 
such as the use of a germanium diode in the transducer unit. For both Jurgensen and Radova, this technological development, uh, in general, the technological development, was not done alone, but with some guidance from the speaking spirits themselves. And this is an ongoing trope of the EVP community today, or in the EVP community today. Ghosts are collaborators in the reorientation of sound technology. They give information uh, about how this worldly technology might be better and better tuned to the otherworldly. Further, spirits of the dead, uh, of dead EVP practitioners, and Raudava is prominent among these spirits, continue to communicate to the living, and these spirits are said to be hard at work on the other side, assembling their own technologies by which to better transmit their messages. So there's scientists on both sides. <laughs> Popular media representations of EVP often focus on the technology as well, but with a decidedly different inflection uh, from the experimental tinkering that I have been finding in my field work. The uh, reality television show Ghost Hunters, for example, relishes in the responsiveness of recording devices, night vision cameras, and electromagnetic field meters. And while this does capture some of the rush that people talk about when they hear an EVP, I think it more broadly works against the open-mindedness of the EVP community with regard to technology. The show's conceit is that nothing is rigged, leaving it to the viewer to exercise their skeptical faculties uh, once proper to a modern-day secular subject. Uh, in a manner that's similar to the magical performances described by Simon During in Modern Enchantments, the cultural power of secular magic Ghost Hunters stages the apparitional encounters as an opportunity for the cultivation of disbelief. Uh, and so there are, you can find online all sorts of arguments about whether the, the show's producers actually did uh, funnel in some recording or make something happen, stage something, whether it's really true that nothing was rigged. And this is the sort of, this is the sort of dynamic of watching Ghost Hunters. I think that's, that's interesting to people. Um, other popular treatments of EVP have been downright ex excoriating. Mary Roach's spook, Science Tackles the Afterlife, gleefully narrates the disenchantment of David Ellis, one of Rodova's students who had originally intended to confirm his professor's findings, but could only conclude that he was hearing what he wanted to hear. Neuroscientist Stephen Novella has written an account of debunking a ghost hunt hunting mission that he attended alongside other members of the New England Skeptical Society, and there are plenty of others uh, to find. Academic literature has fared only slightly better, I think, in giving EVP a generous listen. Anthony Enns and Jeffrey Sconce have, in separate publications, explained EVP as an attempt to preserve autonomous Western subjectivity against the decentering effects of electronic media through hermeneutic labor, and more on that in a moment. The most damning treatment uh, has also been the most extensive one, however. Uh, in his book, Rorschach Audio Art for Illusion, Art and Illusion for Sound, uh, sound artist Joe Banks denounces EVP in favor of a psychoacoustic and more broadly perceptual explanation that he then uses to put forward a theory of artistic creativity, leaving the creativ creativity of EVP practitioners behind. I can sympathize with Banks for wanting to make uh, the case for psychoacoustic explanations of EVP, but in the worst moments of the book, Banks uh, reveals some faulty pattern recognition of his own, suggesting that the sort of madness that causes a person to hear voices in a tape recorder might also cause them to commit acts of violence. Uh, and so if anyone fits the framework put forward by Sconce and Enns, it seems to me it's Banks who attempts to suture the gap in reality that these voices produce with appeals to sanity and safety. But I want to now return to the outskirts of Manchester, New Hampshire, where JT stopped her recorder and we listened back to what it had, uh, to what it had heard and to what we might not have. As the recording played, the little speaker of the DR60 snarled intermittently through its plastic mesh, and JT annotated the sounds. That was a dog, she would say, but that was the dog who was running around. Uh, and at other times, that one is a class C. Among Radova's con uh, contributions to EVP is the classification system that is in use by most practitioners today. A Class C EVP designates the lowest quality recording of a ghost, a Class A, obviously, the highest. Uh, the latter contains meaningful words or even full sentences expressed in a clear voice. The voice may have an accent denoting nationality, uh, as well as cadential or tonal features that augment its semantic content. Sometimes the listener can attribute the voice to a person, often a departed beloved, sometimes a historical figure. As one might imagine, Class A recordings are both rare and the subject of much interest and discussion. JT has only recorded a few during the years she has practiced. 
Class C recordings, however, are a constant presence, almost annoying in their ubiquity. Uh, several informants have mentioned that there is a risk associated with paying too much attention to them, namely hearing things that aren't actually there. <laughs> that said, Class C EVPs nonetheless stand the most basic e um, stand as the most basic evidence uh, for a central tenet of EVP that beyond the scope of the limited human sensorium lies a spirit world that suffuses physical reality. The spirits of the dead are all around us, and they are often trying, and usually failing, uh, to communicate. So it deserves to be said, most often when one is listening to EVPs, one is hearing the failure to communicate, the distance between the here and the hereafter. After we had finished combing through JT's recording, I asked her the uncomfortable question that occurs to anyone even the least bit skeptical about EVP. JT, after all, had lost her daughter 10 years earlier from complications related to brain injuries she sustained in a car accident. In the years since her death, JT had received numerous communications from her, either her voice directly or the voices of other spirits speaking about her or carrying messages for her. Each new recording then held the possibility of further communication. Some would argue, I said, that you're just hearing these voices because you want to hear them. To this, I expected one of several responses from JT, a direct re refutation based on her lived experience or on the quasi-scientific experiments of EVP practitioners, or perhaps a frustrated rant about the prejudice of mainstream science and the bullheadedness of self-appointed skeptics. All of these I had heard before from various other informants. Above all, I expected JT to explain that however much she may want to hear her dead son, uh, daughter speak, this did, desire did not play a part in producing the voices whose clear audibility and unexpectedness was available as proof to both of us in the physical recordings. Instead, I was surprised. Of course I want to hear them. If I didn't want to, I wouldn't hear them, she said, and went on to explain that such wanting is part and parcel of the recording process. The emotional energy of that wanting, she told me, uh, <laughs> contributes to the total amount of energy at the ghost's disposal. This is important because contrary to their representation in horror films, ghosts are weak. At worst, on their own, they can inspire feelings of dread, guilt, and anxiety through their words. And many of my informants are fond of saying that, uh, pointing out instances where they've made recordings of insults to them, and then they will say, well, if you were an asshole in this world, you're going to be an asshole in the next world as well. Um, but the energy with which they accomplish any of this uh, comes from one of two sources, the emotional state of the listener, uh, donating emotional energy, or the ambient sound of the physical world. In other words, the very breeze and traffic that surrounded me and JT during our recording. Put simply, spiritual energy and sonic energy are not categorically different, and the sound apparatus is a point of contact between them. Later in our conversation, JT said that EVP was her form of grief therapy. And while I can't say how my Ederol R09 digital recorder felt about this statement, I recall perking up immediately. After all, one can see how useful such a statement might be for an ethnographer, as it implicitly gives permission to fit EVP neatly into a larger theoretical understanding of mourning. Not only that, but it neutralizes the pesky matter of belief by abstracting this practice, all of this by the pra uh, practitioner's own admission. But if EVP is grief therapy, it is a sort of therapy that contests the dominant models of grieving rather than plays into them. In Mourning, Modernism, and Postmodernism, Tammy Cluel describes a shift in Freud's theory of mourning from his 1917 essay, Mourning and Melancholia, to his re-theorization in The Ego and the Id in 1923. In the former, mourning involves the total renunciation of a lost love object through the painful decathexis of libidinal energy and the transfer of that energy to some new object. In the latter, it is the instantiation of the libidinally cathected form of the love object as part of the very constitution of the ego. EVP can be read to fit either scenario. Several of my informants have described how their interest in EVP waned over the years as the demands of uh, this wor their this-worldly lives offered less and less time for it. Um, and one might assume also that the, the more contact that took place, the more a sort of decathexis of of love for, uh, or libido was uh, was taking place. And, and um, JT herself told me that uh, increasingly she had received messages from her uh, daughter saying, I can't talk right now, um, or I'm not going to be able to talk for a while, uh, or I have business to attend to here in the spiritual world. Um, at the same time, 
Uh, those recordings are archived in tapes and computer hard drives, as well as the memories and shared narratives of members of the EVP community. And this might be understood as a sort of sarcophagal retention of these love, lost love objects, uh, forming part of, part of a modern day media networked ego, let's say. They certainly aren't destroyed or, or gotten rid of, they're held on to as artifacts. In both, uh, in both examples, however, of these two types of mourning, uh, a sort of putting to rest is undertaken in the work of mourning. I would like to offer an alternative uh, vision of what JT's grief therapy might mean. In its technological inventiveness, EVP reorients uh, everyday sound technologies to tune into frequencies of experience that mainstream science does not. Uh, these do not come easily, however, rather access as an ongoing process of making recordings, tweaking technology, listening and thinking. Nor is the possibility of a future discovery precluded when is searching for new terrain, not re-walking the old. Rather than quarantining the dead in some stable situation, EVP opens itself up to yet unknown possibilities, a kind of mourning that does not return as dominant paradigms of both mainstream science and mainstream grieving demand to everyday life as usual. Thank you.